first Maccabees 348 with Vocab Malone. A lot of us know him. A lot of us don't like him. Uh, <laughs> he's the, 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 the bad boy of urban apologetics, Mr. Vocab Malone. What's going on, sir? What's up? How you doing, man? Thanks for having me on. And uh, look forward to talking about icons and <laughs> first Maccabees and white jesus oh man white jesus so for those who are uninitiated sir who are you and what do you do on these youtube streets uh, my name is vocab i'm a racially ambiguous individual <laughs> and uh the lord blessed me that way my whole life <laughs> and uh you know uh i am interested in things that affect uh, right where I live, right where I stay, and people that I know. And so most of the apologetic issues I got into, with a few exceptions, are because of that very personal type of thing as far as, hey, this person, that person, hey, what's up? You know, Let's build about these things you're talking about. And so Hebrewism is one of them. You know, That's a, a big one, a main one, discussing that, understanding that. And trying to keep up with it, you know, it's always evolving. There's always something new there, you know. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. But I do uh, apologetics in the street and also online. And so you can catch me on YouTube, Facebook is where I've been lately, and Instagram. Although my Instagram is mixed. I do what you're not supposed to do. Put pictures of family and stuff like that. So it's not just apologetics. You're supposed to just have one thing for your branding. But that's too boring. So I just... <laughs> do whatever and see what people like but ultimately i do want to educate uh the church i want god's people to be aware of cultural currents even if they're kind of underground cultural currents and hebrewism is one of those those frankly bad ideas knocking on the door of the church saying let me in let me in and we want to say maybe you should come back never <laughs> right and of course you know we uh a, a small band of um, of interesting individuals. We have banded together to create an apologetic, a, a defense for these type of uh, um, doctrines. And um, uh, between you and like faithful to God, you guys are you know you guys do amazing work when it comes to dealing with some Hebrew Israelites. I don't want to say all because you know I understand that that community is not monolithic, just like the Christian community is. Because they always like to say that we lump them up in the same boat. So here's the caveat: some Hebrew Israelites, right? Um, and I mean, you, you've done amazing work. Actually, you know what? Before I even do that, before I even go into that, uh, and I've done this before, but you know, always like to give you your flowers when you come to the platform. You know, uh, for those who may not know, you know, vocab is actually very inspirational uh to this particular platform you know he definitely encouraged me to to have a, a more larger internet uh footprint and here i am so if you have issues with my platform blame vocab mm -hmm. and uh but yeah bro i really appreciate you uh extending the right hand of fellowship to me and you know it, it's i'm very grateful so i just want to once again put that out there so hey man i i'm glad to see you doing your thing uh you know, some people get involved with uh, urban apologetics and, like, for example, maybe they'll take on the Hebrews lights a little bit, but then they kind of get burnt out. They get tired of it. They move on to something else. But I like to see, and that's fine. That's fine. You know, God talks to his people, whatever. But I like to see, you know, you, you cover a variety of things, but still sticking with these issues. You know, and that's why we're able to talk about this today because you're sticking Absolutely. with it. Exploring Absolutely. different areas. So that's, that's good to see, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. So with that being said, dealing with um, the, the multi-layered issues within the Hebrew Israelite community um, that you have hi have highlighted over the years, one of the things that, that you have definitely have brought about is they have a very faulty hermeneutic. And I know I just used a $20 word. So if you could break down for the people what is hermeneutics and why is their approach to hermeneutics um suspect well sure <laughs> see there was this guy a long time ago uh named herman and so oh lord <laughs> so, wow <laughs> <laughs> no uh i remember when i remember when i first heard hermeneutics i heard the the word homiletics right with it mm, and yeah, so yeah. i was like crap 
hermeneutics, homiletics, which one's which? Because <laughs> homiletics has to do with preaching, and hermeneutics more has to do with uh, interpretation. Now, hermeneutics is across the board in regards to literature. So there's Shakespearean hermeneutics, meaning how do you interpret this passage from Shakespeare, this and that, right? And so, so it, it deals with all literature. For most Christians, obviously, most hear it first time if you hear it in the context of interpreting, understanding, and I agree, some would say, and I agree with this, some would say applying. So what is in the text? So hermeneutics is, is supposed to be an art and science, really, uh, where you, you, you try to understand what is in the text, what is it not saying, what is it saying. Um, and uh, there's, there's really there's a lot of ways to do it in the sense of people might teach variations of approaches, for example, uh, people will speak about inductive Bible study, and uh, I think that's that's important. You simply say, what is there? So you basically ask questions. So you're not really using any tools in the, the initial stage, per se. And at the end, though, at the end, though, you're supposed to have <clears throat> a firm idea of what the text means. And, um, and then you synthesize it with other data that the Bible has as well. Uh, to to see if it systematically lines up because some people think the Bible contradicts itself, so they'll say it means this, and they just won't try to reconcile it with something else. But we also seek to to do some synthesis, right? And uh, I think that's important as well. If you hold the Bible as the Word of God, you don't want to have an interpretation that directly contradicts something else. And uh, it, it really is something that, by God's grace, you get better at over time. It's a definitely a skill that you develop. A, a good book. This is like. If you're going to go that level to read a book, Grant R. Osborne, The Hermeneutical Spiral, mm. A Comprehensive Introduction to Biblical Interpretation. The idea is that each time the text shapes your understanding better and better each place you read. And the idea is over a lifetime, you're getting closer and closer and better and better understanding of what the text really means with each text that you look at in relationship to other texts. And uh, it's really a lifelong a lifelong joy for the Christian to have. We end up in debates with people about it, but ultimately, you know, we, we want to treasure the word in our heart. And we, we don't want to be thinking it means one thing when it means something else. We want to do that so we might not sin against God, and so we can bring it out and resist temptation, all kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's really a joy and a pleasure. I try to never lose sight of that, to say, let's, let's get into this. What does this really mean? What's really there? Right. And then draw it out by God's grace. Right. No, absolutely. Because um, for many of us, we forget that the Bible is a historical document. Right. And because of the nature of that, that, that it presents itself some legitimate obstacles. Right. There's um, it's written in, in scripts that many of us don't read, uh, written by people we'll, we'll never know um, in places that we've never been to. And if you've been to those places, you have been there during those times. So there's multiple contexts that we're missing, you know, it's like um, we, we, uh, we miss the punchlines, you know, because they're, they're talking to each other, you know, we're kind of ear hustling 2000 years later into their conversations. So we want to get the flavor of what they were dealing with, you know, the political climate, um, the, their, their former slang, you know, so that we can have a better understanding while making sure that we don't smuggle in our own presuppositions into the text, right? We, we want the text to speak for itself. We want to understand it by the writer's perspective and the writer's original audience, right? And unfortunately, I feel like for many, not all, he was like, but for many, they don't do their due diligence when it comes to that. And we've seen many, many occasions where they'll take certain proof texts and because they did, they were, to be honest, lazy, in their comprehension, mm -hmm. they they come up with different types of interpretation. Now, part of it comes with their presuppositions as well. You know, if, if you believe that the Bible is only for Israel, your brain will self-censor the passages when you read. You know, so that's why you got to really be careful about what you're bringing into the text. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, we want to use this particular passage as an example of, you know, understanding the proper context. Now, as a caveat, you know, this is not a video about whether or not First Maccabees should be part of the canon. I know within the Christian spectrum, there are some of us who do believe that that's not what we're discussing. Right. The reason why we're talking about this, honestly, is because 
I'm tired of seeing a very particular meme <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that goes with this particular verse. And I'll show you what I mean, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure we've all seen this meme in our timelines two to three times a week, right? This is how the Hebrew Israelites, the Bible became white, right? And they use first Maccabees 3, 4, 348. And um, you, can, you can't really see it too well in, in this meme, but um, vocab, how many times have you seen this meme since you've been in a, an apologist? A lot. Uh, yeah, th- that guy has definitely got around. Uh, he has he has definitely been passed around. Um, wow. He looks to be Eastern Orthodox, of course. And Here we Eastern go. Orthodox we'll start. folks. We'll start. <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah, we'll right. Start. <laughs> they have a whole um, theology of icons. And uh, they, they they take iconography very, very serious. I would say uh, iconography is more part of their tradition than Roman Catholics. People usually know some pictures or paintings here and there in regards to Roman Catholicism. And they may know some statues, for example, that element. But when you talk about icons, the Eastern Orthodox really uh, take the cake. Now, there's different types of um, I'd be incredibly interested to know where this image came from. The I've been looking. I've been looking for the original photo that I can't find it. Yeah, it looks to be late twentieth century, based upon what I've seen. Uh, you know, from uh, like the photography, not this particular image, but it looks to be late twentieth century. Uh, and um, it'd be nice to know the source. The funny thing is, because in the source, I bet it'll say what's happening and it won't be exactly. quite nefarious. Exactly. And that's know. why I'm looking for the original photos yeah. to, to do just that. But yeah, but Hebrews lights aren't known for accurately understanding their own sources or knowing where to find them. It literally is uh, sometimes a house of cards built upon memes such as that one. So yeah, I've seen that a whole lot. So to have a clearer view of the actual verse here, and the King James says, and laid open the book of the law, wherein the heathen had sought to paint the likeness of their images. So here's another caveat. If you are a big fan of the King James Version, amen. Keep your King James Version, right? By reading the King James, you can have a robust and amazing journey with Christ and be an amazing man and woman of God. As long as you understand the archaic English of the text, so by no means are we trying to, you know, bash the King James Version. With that said, though, you know, uh, the 1611, you know, was a decent translation for its time. But since then, we have, as uh, I think William B. Wallace will say, uh, an embarrassment of riches when it comes to Greek manuscripts. And not only do we have more manuscripts, we have more manuscripts that date closer to the original autographs. So through... A, a healthy and robust methodology and, um, you know, uh, textual criticism, we are inching closer and closer to trying to have the, the canon that our first century brothers and sisters have, which is very interesting vocab, why many Hebrew Israelites don't appreciate that. Because again, the presupposition is, this is my, not only is this the word of God, it's, it's a family heirloom. Right. As when I'm reading about Paul yeah. and these, these individuals, this is family. Why wouldn't you want a version of these texts that are closer to the ones that your family actually had? Right. So. But. um, So with that. You know, we have more texts when it comes to Maccabees. So we have more modern translations. So Maccabees in these uh, are these modern translations are as follows, right? In addition, they open up the law scroll to find answers to the kinds of questions Gentiles would ask of their idols. In the DRA, it's rendered, and they laid open the books of the law in which the Gentiles search for the likeness of their idols. If I could show everyone, sure. this right here oh, is from what this red book. Yeah, that's what <laughs> most Hebrew Israelites use. As far as one Wester's for their apocrypha, it's the King James Version apocrypha, right? Uh, usually published by Cambridge, right? And um, that's the translation that they use from the apocrypha out of Maccabees. Of course, we're talking about First Maccabees three forty-eight. They read that there, 
misunderstand what it's saying, partially due to some of, I might say, confusion in the way it's translated. And that's what uh, Alfredo is doing now, showing, hey, it's not, tr it, there's better ways to translate this that give it better clarity. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to, so you can start your interpretation with a better translation, first of all. Right. And so you're showing a couple. I got a couple too after you show yours. Right. Uh, the NABRE says they unroll the scroll of the law to learn about the things of which the Gentiles consulted the images of their idols. The NCB renders it, they unroll the scroll of the law, seeking therein the guidance of which the Gentiles consulted the images of their gods. So, Vocab, I'll let you share some of your uh, translations that you got. So, th those are some of the ones you had? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, Protestants um, probably have neglected the Apocrypha because it's almost like uh, since the Reformation, a lot of us have almost viewed it as like, well, that's an evil collection of books. I'm exaggerating a little. So we may have neglected it. Um, um, even Martin Luther believed that the Apocrypha, the Apocryphal books, were helpful for study. Now, that doesn't mean we uh, believe, and uh, the evidence is on our side in this, that they're divinely inspired, that they're canonical, that they're God's word. So even though we don't see them as Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox see, see them as additions to the Old Testament canon, right? I mean, the Jews never accepted the apocryphal books as canonical themselves. doesn't mean they're not valuable. Also, doesn't mean we shouldn't care about what it's actually saying. We should try to understand what it's saying as well. And so uh, most of what I'm going to be reading from will be Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox sources. So here's the New American Bible. That's one. I got the <laughs> Peter's keys there, I guess. <laughs> First Maccabees chapter 3, verse 48, reads this. <clears throat> they enrolled the scroll of the law to learn about the things for which the Gentiles consulted, the images of their idols. And this is in a massive commentary, but there actually is a little commentary down here, which I found interesting in regards to verse 48. And here's what, it, here's what it says. Favorable omens for the coming battle. So this is one interpretation of it. A contrast is intended between the idol worship of the pagans and the consultation of the word of God by the Jews. Confer 2 Maccabees 8.23. What they're saying is, see this same kind of contrast brought out in another passage where you see basically the Seleucids, which are pagan Greeks basically, you see a contrast between what they would do and these righteous Jews who are rebelling against them. Second Maccabees 8 that they're referring to, verse 23, here's what it says. So you get an idea of what they're saying. There was also Eleazar, after reading to them from the holy book and giving them the watchword, the help of God, Judas himself took charge of the first division and joined in battle with Nicanor. So what you see there is, again, First and second Maccabees may be able to be described as uh, books about God and country, right? It's a lot of prayers, but it's in relation to this nation building that's going on as they rebel against the Seleucids. And uh, so you, they're written by different authors. First Maccabees originally in Hebrew, second Maccabees originally in Greek, although we don't have the original Hebrew, first Maccabees. And so it's, it's helpful still nonetheless to compare them because you're seeing intertestamental attitudes of jews and what they're saying they did in in this and so i think that was helpful that parallel passage as well so there's one then we've got that's the new american bible we got the jerusalem bible we got the jerusalem bible readers edition we go to first maccabees chapter 3 verse 48 and here's what it says for the guidance that the heathen would have sought from the images of their false gods they opened the book of the law and there is, um, let me see, is there an asterisk on that? No, there's not an asterisk on that. And so um, there are some questions about the syntax and, and whatnot. It's, it, it, some people might say, well, is this the heathen seeking guidance? But it seems that it's the Jews seeking guidance about the heathens. Seems to be what it is, even in that one. Here's the Godspeed, or I'm sorry, Goodspeed, well-known apocryphal translator, Edgar J. Goodspeed. Um, here's what he has in first maccabees so this is important this is a common thing that you do a lot of times in understanding a passage is looking at alternate ways to translate it because if there's some radical differences it wakes you up to 
uh, to to something else going on there. Like, okay, wait a minute. Why are these translations different in this area? And notice the KJV Apocrypha is an outlier in these, in the way it's translated. It, it's, it, it's not very close to the other ones, and that's not accidental. Okay, here's what it says here. And they unrolled the roll of the law, such as the heathen used to hunt out and look through for pictures of their idols. So, a little bit different there. And you can see sometimes in the translation, it gets into what the translator believes a possible interpretation of it is as well. This is the last one I'm going to do. This is from the Orthodox Study Bible. From the Orthodox Study Bible, 1 Maccabees. 1 Maccabees, chapter 3, verse 48. And... Um, where did it go? Where did it go? And then we can also look at the uh, Septuagint a little bit because uh, the Septuagint, of course, in Greek, uh, we got uh, the Greek of the Apocrypha as well. So here's the last English one, though. First Maccabees 348 from the Orthodox Study Bible. Here's what it says. They opened the book of the law to look into those matters about which the Gentiles consulted the likeness of their idols. Now, I don't think any of those should lead a person to believe this is saying Gentiles are painting images of their gods or white Jesus anywhere. I don't even really think the KJV would say that, but it's the only one, I guess, potentially where you could make that mistake. I'm trying to be charitable there. I don't know. What do you think, of Alfredo? Because I know you've been looking into this. Um, right. I think longer than I have, to be frank with you. You brought some of this to my attention, which I appreciate. So, you know, I don't know everything. And so, well, I, well, again, I, I was just sick and tired of seeing this meme, really. <laughs> That's why I, I'm, I just want to kill it. But, um, but again, it, it shows, right, even within the King James, it's written in a certain English dialect. And if you're not familiar with how that syntax is played out during that time period, again, right, it's you're smuggling in your modern understanding of the language into the text. So the people who received the 1611 probably did not have that interpretation at all. They probably saw it as, as we see it from the more modern translations. Yeah. You know? So I think that's, that's the issue. Again, putting ourselves into the shoes of the people who lived in the 16th century and how they, how they worded things will, will give us a better understanding of what was being um, conveyed. I actually got a few other translations up. Okay. Um, I don't know if uh, I don't know if it'll show up if I show or share on the screen, but I I realized I had a few more in Lagos. If you're interested in seeing this, I oh. think this is important because it shows you know these these translators aren't crazy. They're not uh, you know I mean they're they're trying to translate the Bible. You know they're trying to trying to get it right. And if you have the King James and being more of an outlier in the way it is, I think it's it's important to understand that. So uh, here, let's look at a let's look at a couple of these. All right. Let's look at a couple of these here. Here, maybe I should. Yeah, share your screen. Yeah, I'm not I'm worried it's gonna be a little small. So I know this is redundant, but someone could actually go track and say, you know, Vocab and Alfredo shared ten other translations, and none of them said quite that. So we're before we do the interpretation, we're starting with a problematic translation of First Maccabees three forty, and that's that's important. And to be frank with you, I don't. <laughs> Gosh, I, I don't really think uh, the Hebrews lights who use this have even like really even considered that like you, before they just start and say that you know and and they should have okay so let's see here share 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 screen uh two monitors share screen okay I'm trying to share it there it is screen two okay all right I should probably make it bigger uh, I will just give me a sec here. Okay. Oh, by the way, to Bodega ladies, you guys get your flowers too. I saw Michelle Turner beefing about they did get their flowers. You guys are amazing, you know. So, you so get flowers. R.H. Charles, uh, well known uh, exegete of yesteryear, talk of the Old Testament. I've already got it up. So, first Maccabees 3 48, and they spread out. They spread out the role of the law, one of those, concerning which the Gentiles were wont to make search in order to depict upon them likeness of their idols. Uh, so that's, you see, that's an older one as well. And they even, he even uh, shows a little bit in the, in the superscript, gets a little bit into other elements as well. So there's that. 
Now let's look at th uh, this right here, which is uh, this is the apocryphal books made from the Latin Vulgate by the men after Wycliffe, because I don't believe he was able to complete the apocrypha. But now we're going to see what they had as well, okay? And, you know, this is a big deal to do, like, translation, especially during these times. So, again, th this is not kind of like you're going to be purposely messing up. Oh, I don't even know if this is going to work, because, look, it's super old English. And they spread in abroad bookers of the law, <laughs> of which <laughs> heathen men soften like this of her. Similaric? Wow. <laughs> okay. I didn't realize I it was quite like that. Our, wow, wow. Okay. That's Here's real, that's real 16th century English right there. <laughs> yeah, it is. The New Revised Standard. Did you already do the New Revised Standard? Yeah. Okay. You already did the New Revised Standard? All right. So let me uh, flip over here. And then, okay, check this out. Now we've got the New Cambridge paraphrase of the Bible with the Apocrypha. All right. We've got that as well. And here's what that one says. And laid open the book of the law, wherein the heathen had sought to paint the likeness of their images. Also, I think they would like that one. That might be closer to what they're looking at. Mm -hmm. Let's see. This is uh, oh, that's because it's the KJV one. Yeah, never yeah. mind. The red, the red book. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Okay, and then here, the AV. This is the old school. Well, this is just showing old school prior. This is the old school uh, mm -hmm. as well. So that's actually similar. So you see, older translations do it that way. Uh, you see, older translations tend to be uh, something like that. But again, the question is: Is that what it means? Um, I don't. I don't think so. And uh, now uh, I was going to look at a couple commentaries on it, but I, uh, I don't know if you want me to show this yet or let you go to your next slides because I know you have slides prepared. So I might maybe I should stop doing that. And I'll just have it ready. Okay, that's cool. So, so right off the the rip, what we see looking at uh, these translations. It clearly shows that there isn't some nefarious agenda to put Clorox on black statues and or portraits, right? There isn't any, you know, we're not. It's not about lighting up, you know, these these um religious artifacts. It has nothing to do with that at all, right? Just based on looking at the multiple translations that we've seen. But the question is, well, what is the context, right? So, with that being said, let me share. Yeah, that's a good point. And it feels like people would kind of catch the obvious in regards to that, Alfredo. Mm -hmm. They have a picture of someone repainting an older icon. If you're going to have a secret conspiracy theory, it doesn't seem like you would take a picture of someone doing it and put it in a book. <laughs> Actually, it, in one of the books, right, that's Russian icons. That's the cover. That, that photo is the cover of that book. Oh, it's the cover of Russian icons. I think so. Yeah, it, one of the books about Russian icons. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah, yeah. So with that, so let's look at um, the early reception of the Torah, right? This is from the Gruda. So, searching the Book of Law, Jewish divination, and First Maccabees three forty eight. Here's how they they looked at it. Um, divination understood as the attempt to foretell the future through the generation and interpretation of signs and portents has gained new interest in recent years. Previously, with regards to Jewish divination, it was widely thought that the prime avenue to consult the divine will was prophecy. Since the text follow, following the prophets Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi do not witness to any new prophet, it has been unclear which methods were used after their time. Now, many scholars agree that divination took different modes in the post-exilic era. One way to search the divine will was the, the consultation of already existing and circulating texts. Decoding the knowledge embedded in these texts was considered a way to access the divine will with concerning future events. In this article, I, am, I aim at contributing to the debate concerning the use of text for divinatory purposes by analyzing one passage, 1 1st Maccabees 3.48 which mentions the use of the book of law in consulting the divine will. First, I will ask how the authors of 1st Maccabees deal with the book of law elsewhere in order to better understand what the authors may have intended with their references to the book of the law. After that, I will examine other details of 1st Maccabees 3.48. Um, so I'll fast forward past that. Sackcloth is at times mentioned in those contexts in which there is a reference 
to searching the divine will. From the prophet Isaiah, who interprets the divine will. Uh, he sent Elikon, who was in charge of the palace, and Shebna, the secretary, and the senior priest covered with sackcloth to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. This example indicates that sackcloth was sometimes worn when the divine will was consulted. I do not argue that sackcloth itself had a divinatory function. It is possible that sackcloth served as a symbol of modesty and a sign of obedience and piety when the deity was approached. And Is he frozen? He appears to be frozen. Oh, okay, you're back. Okay, I'm sorry. All right. You're like, eh. I will now turn to examine the key terms of 1 Maccabees 3.48, those matters in the likeness of their gods. First, one should ask what were those matters of 1 Maccabees 3.38, that the inquiry concerned. Importantly, the passage does not use noun matters, rather the Greek, I can't read Greek. I don't know if you know what that is, um, vocab. Are you familiar with that particular term? Where, rather the Greek? Uh, no. Carry on X-ray meno. I don't no. know what it means. So. Right. But it says but, here, it, mean, it means that they literally searched out what the Gentiles consulted the likeness of their gods. Given the context, it may be that they concern the military activities that the people were preparing, right? And that's the larger context of, of this packet, uh, this chapter, right? They're getting ready to fight the, the, the heathen, the quote unquote heathen. Uh -huh. uh, what, what does it mean to consult the book in a similar manner as the likeness of idols were consulted? The difficulty of 1 Maccabees 348 lies in explaining the connection between the terms likeness and idols, something that you brought up, vocab. Uh, the Greek term that refers to gods is, I don't know, it's like EO, I don't know. It's Eidolon. Eidolon. Yeah, and you can kind of, so that's like, yeah. that's like RE, uh, you know, that's like an English E equivalent when you transliterate. And then that would be like our I, and that would be right. like our D, and that's like our O, and that's like our L, and that's like our O, and that's like our N. Mm. In the old, so it's like Eidolon. In the old Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, that, that term, the term denotes almost exclusively idols in the sense of objects or pictures of gods, as idols themselves are often regarded as, quote, false gods. Their existence and use is condemned severely in various passages of the Hebrew Bible and other Jewish texts. Uh, and there goes to a list of texts. Uh, for quite some time, the scholars of First Maccabees have connected the term with statutes. One of the first to propose such connection was Felix Marie Abel. Other scholars have supported this theory and further elaborated to include the possible use of such statues for consulting the divine will. For instance, John Bartlett has proposed that certain passages may refer to images of gods that could have provided protection for the worshipers. Meanwhile, Diego Aaron Holevel claims that likenesses of their gods had some sort of prophetic function and may represent a practice that was present in the neighboring cultures. Peter W. Van der Hurst, who, had, who has offered the most nuanced reflection on this topic, writes, in the same way in which the Gentiles, by various means of divination, tried to receive a verdict from their gods about the outcome of their enterprises, the Jews opened the Torah scroll at random in the hope that the first line their eyes hit upon would instruct them about the God had in store for them and expected to do so. Therefore, Vanderhurst concluded that a Torah scroll could be consulted as an oracle. I'm going to stop there. So, the way that they're looking at the text from the group, from how the Greek is being parsed, what they're saying is that the Maccabees, when they were looking at the Torah scroll, it wasn't what we're doing right now. It wasn't exegesis per se. It wasn't like, let's understand the text and the context to see how it applies today. They were using it very similar to how the heathen uses their religious artifacts. Right? So, what do you think about that? Well, yeah, so I got an interesting resource here. It's called a, a handbook on First and Second Maccabees. And what it is is, 
uh, these translation societies put out these handbooks on uh, the apocryphal literature and the books of the Bible. And they're designed to be notes specifically for translators mm. when they're seeking to translate the Greek or the Hebrew into uh, a receptor language. And they have a little note on 1 Maccabees 3.48. And uh, it's it gives a couple different ideas for the translator. And let me just share it real quick here. And again, I'm bringing up Logos. And uh, I guess I should tell people that if they use my uh, code and stuff, yeah, that they can get a discount on Logos. Put it in my um, put it in the private chat. So I'll put it in. The yeah, room. yeah, yeah. Just let me uh, get to that. But but so here, let me make it a little bit bigger. And so this is the commentary on here, and it gives a couple different options. And let's take a look at this. And they opened the book of the law to inquire into those matters about which the Gentiles were consulting the images of their idols. This verse is unclear. So a lot of commentaries say that there are several interpretations. They open the scroll to find those passages where instruction is given about dealing with Gentile idols, Duran. So that's that's one way to look at it. It's like, okay, so they're looking at biblical passage relating to idolatry, basically. So that's that's one way to understand it, right? Or, and this is, this is part of what you do in hermeneutics. You, you look at alternative or sometimes rival interpretations and consider them before settling on ones that work. In, in, in the sense of they make sense of the passage in related areas. Here's another understanding. They found those passages that Antiochus had pointed out as allowing for the worship of Gentile gods. Uh, Goldstein, that doesn't seem likely to me, to be frank. They opened the scrolls on which the Gentiles had drawn pictures of their idols. So that would be uh, something similar to what Hebrews likes would end up and say, to dash a textual matter. And that's important because there's there's some confusion about what's in the underlying text. So we have First Maccabees in Greek. We don't have it in Hebrew. But here's what you have to do if you're going to really get into this. If you make an interpretation from what you, from your understanding of this, as you look at the Greek of First Maccabees three forty eight, whatever it is has to also make sense in Hebrew. The problem is you don't have the Hebrew. So it's sort of like a backwards reconstruction that these are more high-level scholars. This is like not something I would think I would be equipped to do, for example. Um, and if people were humble, they would realize this is a higher-level thing. You go back and then say, okay, if this is what the text was saying, then what would it have looked like in Hebrew? And it has to be something that would have made sense in the Hebrew because we don't have the Hebrew of First Maccabees. The whole book, we only have the, uh, a Greek translation. And there's lots of signs that it was translated out of Hebrew into Greek, right? Mm. Um, not not so with Second Maccabees. Second Maccabees is clearly written in Greek as its an, an, an initial initial run. So here's here's what they say next: the interpretation reflected in GMB, that's a Good News Bible, is the most commonly held, and we recommend it. So they're giving advice for translators which way to go. Again, this is a serious thing because this would relate to missions work and new Christians and things like that. So this, the, you know, they're not trying to play around. This is a big deal stuff. People risking their lives to translate into to new languages. This is a pioneering work. So again, it's a serious thing. Apparently, someone opens a scroll at random to find guidance from whatever passage shows up. And that's, uh, I think, what the article you're looking at is essentially saying. And people still do this today. So this is not like a way out there understanding. Because remember, the intertestinal period is not one of of uh, you know the Jews are getting everything right, for example, right. and one thing is uh, this, which today the nickname I've always heard for this is called lucky dipping. You know, you like flip open the Bible and be like Psh, read it. So it, it appears they may be lucky dipping, but with a scroll. Right. Such use of scripture is referred to nowhere else in scripture, unless the same thing is met in Second Maccabees eight twenty three. That's the passage I brought up earlier that a lot of people see as a comparative passage with the, but then it's like okay is that what that's saying there right so we see the clear thing they're consulting god's word that i think that's the clear thing mm -hmm. but then the question is okay then what, what next and see that's why the note here says a passage with its own problems gmb's translation does not spell out just how the scroll was used but it is not necessary to do so the greek is certainly not clear gmb said what needs to be said but with some modification Opened means unrolled, since the book of the law was a scroll. Here are other models for the verse. 
The Gentiles would have consulted or prayed to their gods, but the Israelites opened or enrolled the book of the law to find out what the one in heaven wanted them to do. So even if they're doing sort of an abnormal practice, for example, it seems still clear that at least the other name for that is called Bible bingo. <laughs> I never heard that one. Okay. Uh, well, maybe the Catholics like it. Sorry. Ah, oh, this guy. <laughs> bingo. You know, it's funny. One of the canons of Nicaea is that there should be no games of chance in the houses of worship. And uh, if you're a Catholic and you like say you Protestants seem to believe in all the canons of Nicaea, not just the creed itself, it's like, well, tell that to the old ladies because you guys got some games of chance. It might be yeah. lit, boy. What? Yeah, I don't think you know about the canons of Nicaea. I'm Catholic bingo night. I'm just saying, instead of praying to idols as the Gentiles would do, the Israelites looked in the law of Moses to find out what they should do. So it seems like the essence of it is sort of a. Uh, for lack of a better word, well-meaning in the sense of there's a contrast. The question is, what exactly were they doing when they opened it? Right. There's some confusion about the text, so, and I think the commentary reflects it. These other commentaries are much shorter. Uh, they spread out in order that the role of the law might bear witness before God against the blasphemous proceedings of against the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So it's like, let's find out what the Bible says about the messed up Gentiles. And uh, the, the one last, uh, it's called a new commentary on Holy Scripture, it says, uh, the text seems to be at fault. What they're saying is there's confusion in the underlying text. Slight emendation of what was probably the Hebrew original would give for the second clause, which the Gentiles were seeking in order to work upon them the likeness of their idols. Another emendation of the first clause would give instead of the book of the law, which would have no special connection with the temple at Jerusalem. So uh, this is what's called context con conjectural textual emendation. So I... I don't abide by it because I think you should have a clear textual basis before you conjecture about an emendation, which means an alternate reading that you're saying was original, but you don't have any physical evidence for it. The reason why I'm showing this, though, because I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I agree with that practice. Now, to be honest, I'm less offended by it, to be frank with you, when it comes to the Apocrypha than with the Bible. Uh, but, uh, you know, here's the book that I was just looking at by right now. Right right. There. Uh, partially edited by... The, you know, these guys see 1928, but the but the point is, usually unless there's something else going on, scholars don't do that unless there's some kind of confusion in the construction about what's underlying it, and that's why you you see that there. But um, it seems uh, highly unlikely the interpretation about Hebrews lights, because it's like what are you what are they literally saying? It appears they're literally saying. Gentiles were drawing pictures of false gods in Hebrews Bibles. Right. I think that's what they are literally saying is going on, right? Isn't that what they're basically trying to say it means? The well, Hebrews are how, Hebrews Elites. That's not how you know some Hebrew Elites are. They, what they're trying to say is somehow it kind of looks like a prophecy that eventually these people will wipe out the the original color, the original look of the people of God. And they use that particular text as proof of, you see, this is why it's happening. It was already mentioned in this particular passage. Right? That's how they, that's so they're how they looking at it as a prophecy? I think so. I think so. But see, so first but that picture three, of that meme doesn't go with that verse. Well, that's, that, but that's what I'm saying. That's why uh, there's problems there with what they're, it seems like they're saying this is something that Gentiles always did or something like that. Mm -hmm. But like, look, so, you know, what is the, what is first Maccabees three about? It's about the leadership of Judas Maccabeus. Right. So it discusses his early victories. These are military campaigns being discussed. Right. You know, it talks about uh, the King's strategy, speaking of uh, Antiochus, right. And what he, he's doing about this uprising. And then you see starting in verse 38, uh, they're preparing for battle. So all this stuff, starting in verse 38, going all the way to the beginning of chapter 4, which is down to verse 60, it's about their preparations for battle. So right. like to get the fuller context, because I know we haven't really looked at it, mm -hmm. but if we did it, you would see it's like people pitching tents and foot soldiers doing this, and it's counting numbers, and they're gathering together, and they're hearing speeches and all this kind of stuff. It has... It's not about this is not some prophetic prediction. And in part of what they're doing in their preparation for war is looking at a Hebrew, well, 
you know, it, it's you would you would imagine it seems like it's probably a Hebrew scroll, but a biblical scroll nonetheless. Right. In regards to the Gentiles and their idolatry, um, it, it's it's sort of odd or out of place if they're if they're like saying all of a sudden there's a prophecy as they're preparing for war. The Maccabees they're preparing for war against Gentiles, and there's a prophecy that says. Oh, in the future they're going to do this. Because listen just to the verse right in front of it. Thus they assembled and went to Mizpah near Jerusalem, because formerly at Mizpah there was a place of prayer for Israel. That's verse 46, verse 47. That day they fasted and wore sackcloth. They sprinkled ashes on their heads and tore their garments. So clearly, spiritual preparation for the battle, right? Verse 48. They unrolled the scroll of the law to learn about the things for which the Gentiles consulted the image of their idols. So that's why I think the best understanding is, saying, let's open up the Bible and find out like about this crazy, you know, Gentile idolatry. This is spiritual preparation. Right. So, look at that. It's like their reason for battle. Verse 49. They brought with them priestly garments, the first fruits and the tithes, and they brought forward the Nazarites who completed the time of their vows. Again, spiritual preparation for the physical battle. And they cried aloud to heaven. So, now they're praying. What shall we do with these and where shall we take them? For your sanctuary has been trampled on and profaned. So, it's a spiritual issue they have plus mm -hmm. the, lo the loss of autonomy. And your priests are in mourning and humbled. Now the Gentiles are gathered together against us to destroy us. You know that what they plot against us. How shall we be able to resist them unless you help us? Then they blew the trumpets and cried out loudly. So all of this is preparation for battle. So it'd be strange if all of a sudden this is a prophecy of the future in the middle of that. That doesn't make sense. This is something current right there. And it'd be it doesn't make sense to say they open up one of their own scrolls and discovered, oh, the Gentiles have been painting images in here. <laughs> they've been painting because that some of the videos I watched by Hebrews lights, that's what they were saying. Mm -hmm. They discovered they discovered that they've been putting pictures of their idols inside the inside the but see, this is a scroll. This isn't a book. So again, they're unrolling a scroll. They the way they did this is everything is compact in there. They would have it a certain amount of lines, and now mm -hmm. they took less care, they took less care with the apocryphal uh, scrolls. But this is the apocrypha talking about mm -hmm. uh, the the Torah. That's right. right? Mm -hmm. So open up the scroll. You you can't insert a picture into a scroll. You can't cut it and do it like old style editing with a real. You're gonna cut the back, with, which has more lines. Yeah, there's a, <laughs> it's called the recto and the verso. Right, right. Uh, a lot of times they would they would do that. So how, but how would you, how would, how are they inserting pictures of their gods into there? Maybe it's some kind of scrapbook. How scrapbook are they getting a hold of these <laughs> scrolls to do this? Right. And if they discovered, they would already know, oh, look at this, look at this image. And notice, even if that was a person's interpretation, which is clearly wrong, it has nothing to do with the ethnicity of the god. It's just saying these are idols, right? Just saying these are false idols. That's all it's saying. Right. So the, the whole interpretation is really weird and not that doesn't fit the context at all when you read the context it's about a preparation for battle that's the context of first maccabees 3 everybody and then in chapter 4 it gets into their victory right they they win so uh they win a couple battles actually so and then they rededicate the temple at the end of chapter 4 so <laughs> the hebrews lights are not even interpreting the bible properly so i guess we shouldn't be surprised if they're not interpreting the apocrypha accurately as well. Well, again, right, and this is this is the issue that we have with with, with many of them is is now and it, I, you know for some reason they refuse to import their reading comprehension skill that they learned from grade school when it comes to these things because it's hard for me to believe that none of these guys don't know how to read. You know, for some it might actually be the case, but for many, you know. Like, you know, context clues, the who, the what, the where. It's like you learned that in grade school. It's like use that skill set in here. But for some reason, they suspend that when it comes to these quote unquote sacred matters. Right. And again, you, you, we've shown if you read the context in which these things are transpiring, it is not saying what that meme is trying to declare at all. Yeah. It's not about repainting light images. Right. And again, if it was a big conspiracy, it doesn't make sense that they have a picture of it like that. It, it with the, and again, it's, I think it's important to understand how important, like the Eastern Orthodox, for example, take their icons. They're not gonna willy nilly uh, try to. It's like altering it for racial purposes or something. In fact, um, the Eastern Orthodox believe some of them believe some of their icons go back to Jesus physically, so they wouldn't want to 
they wouldn't want to change it if they thought that. Now, I'm not saying that particular icon, but some of the ones they think because they have a strange tradition that some of them believe Luke, St. Luke, as they call him, was an icon painter and actually essentially painted like Mary, like in real life almost, uh, is my understanding. No, I'm not saying they all believe that, but uh, meaning they think there's a connection. Whereas Roman Catholics have sort of a more universalistic understanding, like they are okay with parishioners making images of Christ, which I'm not a fan of that anyway, but uh, in whatever ethnic category they want. So like Chinese Catholics, they'll have a, you know, crucifix with like a Chinese looking Jesus on it. That happened. I'm not saying they always do. Sometimes they just got right. the white one. That's the predominant one. I'm not denying that, but like they'll, they'll do that. And they view it as a sort of a universality expression of the church, you know, how you see Christ and how you relate to him. Again, there's problems and all that kind of stuff, but he was like oversimplify as if literally there was this massive grand conspiracy to change all the the Bibles with and it <laughs> Hebrew scrolls aren't really known for having images in them though. Like they're not they didn't they didn't have images. Right. It was that later on during the medieval what, area when they got into century. the illumined texts where right. they would right. actually do right. that kind of thing. Right. Sorry, what'd you right. say, bro? No, I, I was what to your point. That that doesn't occur to what, the 14th, 15th century, the illuminated texts? Yeah, that's a later thing. So right. it's like an image in general would be odd, but it's like you look at it, you say, is that really saying that Greeks somehow got off Hebrew, Hebrew scrolls and then put images of of what, though? Because here's the other thing. Alfredo, this is in between the Testaments, right? Right. I, I feel like everyone should pay attention to this. I think I had a book on it. Where was that? Yeah. This is a book on the intertestamental period, right, Charles mm -hmm. Pfeiffer? It's titled Between the Testaments because the Apocrypha takes place basically, for the most part, in between the Old and New Testament, which is about 400 year period, for the most part, there's additions to Esther and stuff like that that are different, and some apocryphal, apocryphal texts. So, everyone, um, was Jesus on the scene during the intertestamental period between the closing of Malachi, to say it colloquially, and the beginning of Matthew? Jesus wasn't on the scene. So, it can't be a repainting of Jesus Christ, yet the meme says that and has an image being retouched up of an icon of ostensibly Christ. So, everything about it is backwards. It doesn't make sense. Who exactly would the Greeks have been repainting then if that's what they were doing? Right. The, the Israelites aren't portraying Yahweh. They got in trouble for that. They're not going to do that in their scroll. These are people trying to be faithful Israelites. Who are they repainting? But they're not, they don't have images. They don't do images of the divine like that. Later on, right. you get uh, things like Dura Europus, which which uh, there are some questions about what is a synagogue, da, 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 but appears to be an early Christian church and may have had some Jews there. And there are some images. That's way in the like third century, and that's a whole different conversation. But you don't... What exactly would they be talking about? If they're saying it's a prophecy, it makes no sense in, it's inserted into a passage about preparation for battle and for war. So basically what I'm saying is, we as Christians don't want the Hebrews to misuse the Bible. To be frank, we also don't want them to misuse the Apocrypha, because that's not what it's saying. Sorry, I got on a high horse for a second. Go ahead. Or no, that's cool. Horse. But I think what you just showcased was the, the main issue with the hermeneutic is that it's based on the sharpshooter fallacy, right? They make a point, and then they try to you know find scriptures that will fit that point instead of looking at the scriptures first and to draw to draw out what the scriptures are actually saying. They're doing the opposite. I have this point, and I'm going to make these scriptures, I'm going to shoehorn scriptures, or or in this case, you know, the Apocrypha, and, and make it fit my point, right? And, mm -hmm. and that's what they're doing. It's, it's the sharpshooter fallacy, you know? Yeah, so some serious, serious problems. And so, you know, Christians, if we started chasing down all the misuses of the Apocrypha by the Hebrew Israelites, it's a whole new ball game because usually we start with the biblical passages. You know, we don't focus on the apocryphal ones as much because right. we understand, well, that's not the word of God. But let's say that the apocrypha has some accurate history in it. There are some historical mistakes, but it does have some accurate history in it. So let's say we're looking at this and we say, okay, I have no reason to not take this as historically accurate or true. So it tells you about some things going on in the intertestamental period. And it's actually helpful for understanding some of the background into basically the world which Jesus was coming. And so, you know, we also care about truth. We value truth. God is a God of truth. And so uh, these writings, which are important and which have benefited a lot of people, spiritually, historically, all kinds of ways, such as First Maccabees, 
we also uh, should care about the misuse of those texts to try to say things that isn't being said. And when you really look at what 1 Maccabees 348 is all about, put with the Hebrews light interpretation, put next to the picture that they use, it's three totally discordant things. Their interpretation is not from the text, and the picture has nothing to do with the verse. It's it's horrible. But I can't tell you how many Hebrews lights got there. Oh, way too many get elements of their theology from memes. And they'll try to say that's not the case, but I know for a fact there's been times where I've essentially caught them. Literally, their only source for something was a meme. This is a real thing. Right. Christians can fall into that, too. And we should not. We should always be like, let's double check this. That's why we, the Hebrews like to, uh, you know, show us the the original page of where that one image comes from. Then t tell us, demonstrate to us why First Maccabees three forty eight really means what you're saying, what it means, right? Massive, massive issues, interpretation, and it's just, it's just sad. Now, some of them watching will be like, oh, so is vocab saying that they're, they probably wouldn't use this word, but. Is Vocab saying that Europeans didn't try to foist a, a white image of Jesus upon us? We're, that's not we're not talking about that at all, right? That's we're talking about this particular verse, the meaning, in relationship to the to the, the meme that they use in the picture. That's what we're talking about. And it doesn't mean that, and that's not what's happening in the picture. Right. And the picture is a totally different context than the verse. And right. their interpretation of the verse is totally different than the context of the chapter. So that's what we're talking about. We're saying this doesn't mean Gentiles were inserting pictures of white something, of their idols. During like During their preparation for war against the greco Roman. <laughs> right, right. Bizarre, right? Right. Let me, let me share one. Actually, I'm not going to share the whole article, but I just want to get this here. It says, um, this is Ancient Jewish Bibliomancy by Peter W. Van der Hurst, University of Utrecht, the Netherlands. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but... Just so you know what bibliomancy is, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, the word bibliomancy, uh, etymologically from divination by means of, divination by books or by verses of the Bible, was first recorded in 1753. Sometimes this term is used synonymously with stitchomancy from roll, line, verse. Um, line by line, precept by precept. Anyway, uh, divination by lines of verses and books taken at hazard. Which was first recorded in 1693. So basically, what this this writer is trying to say is, the way he sees it, based on you know the cultural um, milieu of the time of, of the Maccabees, is that when they were consulting the text, the methodology wasn't, you know, I see Jesus. It was consulting it as if it was some kind of mystical text. It was like the Eye of Agamotto from Doctor Strange. Like that. That's kind of how they were using. The, 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 the scriptures, just like the heathens, right? Now, we can, we can argue if that's the appropriate, you know, interpretation or not, but I think it's quite interesting, you know, but what we do know for a fact is that it is not what that meme <laughs> that's that's been in our timelines forever is trying to convey. It's not saying that, but there are some very interesting ways to look at it that is not what the meme says at all, whether we're talking the linguistics, what are we talking cultural context? What are we talking about the actual context of the, ver of the verses prior and after that particular verse? You know, when you do all that, you do not come to the conclusion that that meme seems to try to, to show us. So that's that's the main point. So. Breath of vocab. So. So, yeah, so I think I think we did this justice. Uh. uh. Right, yeah. right. Um, Bill, that sounds esoteric too. Yeah, yes. If that's what they were doing to the text, they wasn't properly respecting the Torah the way they should do. They were using it as if it was like a a, a, a rabbit's foot, right? Which is in contradiction to what Torah says, right? But we are not to practice divination of any sort, even with the text itself. So if this is what the Maccabees were doing, they are in violation of the very law that they were looking into, if that is, that is the case. And that's why I bring that up. It almost sounds like they'd be reading the Bible the way Hebrew Israelites read the Bible. <laughs> wow. So well, well, let me show one other thing on the screen. Sure. Uh, sure. This is from the Septuagint. So most, most folks know uh, when you get to Septuagint, what you have there is... Uh, 
Hold on, let me bring it up. What you have, the Septuagint, is the Greek translation of the Old Testament scriptures. The Greek translations of the Old Testament scriptures. And um, I, I got this that I'm going to bring up on the screen to show you, First Maccabees 3.48. And uh, this is uh, an interlinear is what it is. All right? It's an interlinear. So let me share the screen. So you're going to be able to see the English and the Greek as well. Again, I'm in Lagos. All right. So, Lexum Greek, English, Interlinear Septuagint. And uh, this is from uh, uh, the one with alternate text, but it's part of the same one. So, now I'm going to bring up uh, that. All right. Here it comes. And some of you guys recognize Lexum because of Heiser stuff. And in fact, he was involved with this. Let me show you real quick. If you look. Heiser or did uh, Jeremiah limitations? All right, actually, cool, see that. Cool. All right, now we're gonna go see who did the who did Maccabees. We'll see. Uh, first Maccabees was that guy who was first or second Maccabees. All right, well, we'll just look at this because I'm going on rabbit show. Okay, so now here we are. First Maccabees 348. Can everybody you think it's clear enough? All right, make it bigger one more time and then uh. Get rid of this so it's even bigger. Okay. So uh, here we are looking at it, and now you get a very real sense. And there's really only one reason I'm doing this is to, to draw your attention to the, the one word. Chi and spread out. So here's, here's the Greek on the top in the Greek script. And then here on the next line is the transliteration. So it's it's the way the Greek would be. Right in English, Kai, except Ta Biblion, Tau Namu, uh, and and then it what it does is it parses it, so it gives you like the parts of speech. For example, you see spread. This is this is why this is helpful. You can learn a lot about what's going on here. So you look. Uh, let's see. Hmm. I'm having trouble with. Uh, let me. There you go. So. Law, it's a noun, genitive, singular, masculine. You just got to scroll over it and it shows you. So you see how it's, they spread out the scroll, letter of the law. That's that's what that's what this section right here is saying. And you can even see it, like antinomian is anti-law. A lot of people know that. Deuteron Deuteronomy is second law. That's a Greek term. It's you see it right there. Right. Amos, right? right? And then biblion, people would understand that. That just means a Greek way to say book. That's all that that's all that is. So you can kind of see it, get a sense of it, right? And now here we go down to the next line. So this is what they were doing. Perry, that's about or concerning. And it, it gives you basic definitions of it right down there. So I'm just showing you that. Who or which, Haas is the way you would say that. Uh, so even though in uh, Greek it's it doesn't have the H sound. It's because over top of that is it's a breathing mark, and you're supposed to go ha when you see it. So that's why it's Haas. And then search out, examine, or consult. There's that right there. It's a verb, of course. <clears throat> Ex Arianion. Ta. All right. So you guys, you've seen. So this is what they're doing. Then uh, you get here. This is towards the end of verse 48. Ethnos. So the peoples or the nations, or usually a lot of times in certain contexts translated as Gentiles. Right. That's over there. Uh, ethnos is the root. The way it's actually in the text will say ethne. Uh, likeness, images, and that is homoe mata. It's not icon, right? It's it's this word, which, is, which really means likeness of something. Hmm. But in the context, they'll say, well, that could mean image because an image is likeness, right? Tan. So... The, and here's the order. So in Greek, the syntax, meaning the order of the sentence, will be different. And you understand uh, which is in what place via the inflections. Whereas in English, syntax matters a lot. You know, uh, the boy was, the boy bit the dog or the dog bit the boy is a big difference. In Greek, it doesn't matter as much the syntax. It just shows you the emphasis. Anyways, nation people, uh, likeness, image. And then here it is. So likeness of their idols. So, and that, there's that word we discussed earlier, Eidolon, mm. Eidolon, Altan, and uh, <clears throat> Kai, which is a common Greek conjunction, and mm -hmm. 
and uh, then it gets into the next thing they do in the preparation for war, right? So uh, you you see the basic underlying. There it is, and what's important to what's important to see is that um, it they're clearly referring to scripture, and it's in preparation for war, and it's something to do with something that the nations do. the The question is, what exactly they're doing? Right. Uh, I think the most likely for me at this point, and man, other, I hear one you think is the most likely. It seems like they're trying to consult the Bible in preparation for war to find out, uh, you know, uh, to, to learn more about Gentile idolatry. So they might be like, look, thou shalt have no other gods before me. These Gentiles do it. Uh, they're pagans or he's violating the law. One more reason to fight them. Something like that. But it's not exactly clear, and that's why other rival interpretations are right. valid. But where's this about their painting images in their book <laughs> or or something like that. Oh, it's white not the washing likeness. icons. Right, yeah, it's right. not the likeness of the white man or the it's the likeness of the image. It's the likeness of the idol. That's what they're they're talking about, right? It's just so it's just kind of a clumsy way to refer to idolatry, it appears. But I mean and they may be doing it like in a haphazard way where they're just rolling it open, just looking for something in regards to it. I mean, it, it, that the, the, it may not be very systematic because the way the the way the term is is rolled out. Because that's why it's like some people might say this sounds like lucky dipping or Bible bingo because of that element up there. Mm -hmm. But notice, understanding this, it just. <laughs> That's nothing to do with what the Hebrews lights are saying. Right. But I don't know. What do you think is the most likely interpretation or what kind of comments you want to give? I mean, I, th I think what they're me. trying to replicate, because they're looking into the law. And, you know, we know that in, in the Torah, in, in the historical narratives, you know, a lot of times they would see, they would look for the, the epoch that has what, the thenum and the urnum, right? Oh, and they yeah. would use that to try to figure out what they should do. I got a feeling that that's, that's what they were trying to do since they didn't have that. I think they were trying to do like a, a bootleg version of that with the text itself. You know what I mean? So, but it, it's something, but it, but regardless of, of the methodology of their looking at the Torah, it's within the overall, the overarching theme of preparation for war, not a nefarious scheme to whitewash black, the, the black presence in biblical art. That yeah, you know for a fact. And unfortunately, it seemed biblical art, which is not even of Jesus in this passage, if there was biblical art, and there's not biblical art in scrolls anyway. So the whole thing is like wild that they would be saying that. Yeah. But I feel like he Hebrews like who hold of this are going to say, well, the Apocrypha is a spiritual book too, and at least heathens don't understand it. Maybe there's a heathen for me, and this Jake, he doesn't understand it. You know, they just they don't they don't get it. Uh, but again, it's like it's 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 not even regardless of the the academic things that we show. Regardless of the the you parsing the Greek, let's put all that to the side. If you just read the chapter, just just that. If you just read the chapter, you will not come to the same conclusion as that me. Mm -hmm. You know, we did a lot of extra stuff because we're nerds and we like doing that. But if you just read the text itself, you will not come to that conclusion. You just wouldn't. Right. You just wouldn't. So you can't really can't really argue with that. But um, um. yeah. So I I think we. Hopefully, you know, we put a, a kill shot to this meme. Probably not, you know. But um, if you come across this meme, ladies and gentlemen, the party people in the chat, please give them this video. <laughs> right? Instead of going back and forth in a debate with them in a the thread, give them the video and ask them to debunk what, what's being said here today. 